Good afternoon, King of the Nations. I hope we all are doing well. We're gonna go into a moment of worship and we're so excited about that. But before, I would like to read a verse found in 2 Corinthians 6, and this is verse 16. Uh, it says, for indeed we are the temple of the living God, just as God said. This is a passion translation. It says, I will make my home in them and will walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. Heavenly Father, we thank you that this is truth today. We thank you, Lord, that through the blood of Jesus, we have been made your people because of the blood of Jesus that was shed on the cross for us. We have access to you. You have called us sons and daughters. We're a part of your family. So Lord, I pray that this morning or this afternoon, God, we would worship from a place of family, that we would boldly approach you, Lord, because we know who you are and we know who we are in your presence. Come on, just take a deep breath in his presence today. Father, I pray that you would remove all the blinders in the name of Jesus, that we would see you rightly today. In Jesus' name. Safe way. 
of 2 Corinthians 6. It says, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. In verse 18, it says, I will be a true father to you and you will be my beloved sons and daughters, says the Lord, Yahweh Almighty. He says, I will be a true father to you and you will be my beloved sons and daughters. He's everything that you need today. And it might seem difficult to understand or difficult to wrap your head around it, but he's everything that you need. So in this moment, I just want us to thank him. Right where you are, just thank him for who he is. Lord, we thank you that your word says that you promised to be a true father to us. We don't have to search around for acceptance. We don't have to search around for love, God, but we can go straight to you. And you say that we are your beloved sons and daughters. So we take a hold of our identity this morning. Come on, I don't know if you need that today. But just say, I, if you're, if you're a man, just say, I am a son. If you're a woman, just say, I am a daughter. God, I thank you that you've called us yours. I thank you that you've called us yours. We belong to someone, we belong to you. And so many of us are trying to fit in, we're trying to to seem like we're part of the crowd when he's calling you to be separate, he's calling you to be his. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your love that is for us. And we thank you that you are gently beckoning us. You are gently calling us, Lord, to step away from the crowd, to step away from the noise, to separate, uh, separate from what's normal to our society and our cultures and our communities, God, and just to be with you. And so we thank you, Lord, and we accept your invitation to be with you today. Come on, if this is your heart, just tell him, say, you can have my heart. You can have my mind. You can have my emotions. You can have my culture, come on. Yes, Lord, we praise you, you can have it all. You can have it all, Lord. We thank you for sonship. We thank you for your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Good afternoon, King of the Nations. Pastor Greg Zetz here, and I am so excited today because I just want to wish you a happy Thanksgiving. This is Thanksgiving week. I know that we are going to be together with our families on Thursday, eating that poor turkey that gave his life so that we might put on a few pounds. 
but if you can't meet with family, I'm going to tell you, you have the presence of the Lord with you, and he's going to strengthen you and encourage you and bless you, and we have so much to be thankful for as a community of believers, so much to just think about and meditate upon. God has been good, and he's good all the time. We, I was listening to a song on the way here this morning. He's a good, good father. He's perfect in every way. And so we have the opportunity to magnify the Lord with our thanksgiving this week. So also, also, I want to let you know, if you didn't hear this past Friday, our very own Jesse Hayes had a birthday. And uh, I've known Jesse since she was 11, 12 years old, and you can uh, figure out how old she is now. I won't tell you when she first came into this ministry. But I, <laughs> I'll tell you this much, uh, uh, who was president at the time? Hmm, I think it was um, George Bush. <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm just having some fun. So you get a chance, wish her a happy birthday. Jesse uh, does a great deal for this ministry, and she moves in the power of the Holy Spirit, and she touches many, and she's a true friend. And if Jesse's your friend, you have a true friend. So uh, let her know that you're thinking about her. Amen. Well, we're in the midst of our series on praise. Praise. Praise is a response to who God is, and it's a response to what he has done. And we've talked about why we should praise, how we should praise, when we should praise. If you didn't hear last week's messages, I I would encourage you to listen to that. I know you can't always be here at noon on Sunday. I get that. But, you know, when the Holy Spirit puts a revelation on a pastor's heart for the congregation, it's for everybody, not just for a few. And today, we're going to talk about praise and who should praise the Lord and who should praise the Lord. And we should praise the Lord. You should praise the Lord. So this message is going to challenge us to come into a place of a lifestyle of praise. And that's what I've been emphasizing these last three weeks. And we're just going to go a little higher today. So why don't we pray? Father, in the name of your son, Jesus, we love you. We thank you for your mercy in our life. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you that you didn't pass us by. But God, you heard our cry on that day. You heard our heart and you saw our condition and you had mercy upon us through your son, Jesus. And Father, we were never the same again when we surrendered our life to your Son. We were never the same again when the Holy Spirit came to reside within our heart, to live in us as the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so here we are today, Father, one day closer to the appearing of the Lord. Our salvation, Father, is nearer now than when we first believed. And so I pray that this word would stir hearts. I pray that it would bring conviction into our lives. I pray that it would bring divine alignment. And I pray, Father, just for your presence now to rest upon everyone that's hearing my voice. We bless you and we thank you. You are a good, good Father. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen. We can learn a lot studying the personal responses of people who encountered the power of God, like the man in the temple who was lame for over 40 years, it says in Acts 4. And it says this, after he was healed, you know, Peter looked at him and said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I have I give to you in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And a supernatural supernatural intervention took place in, in, in seconds. And this man who was a beggar, this man who was poor, this man who had an identity of being a a lame man was totally transformed. And it says here in Acts 3 and verse 8, he jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. Or how about David in Psalm 40, one of my favorite passages in the Old Testament. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and he heard my cry. I waited patiently for the Lord and he turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, he, out of the mud and the mire. He, he brought me out of a place that was bigger than I was. He, 
He, he, he met me in a moment because I was totally helpless in my moment. And as a result of that, he took me out of that slimy pit. He put my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see in fear and put their trust in the Lord. All of these are responses, responses to the grace of God. All of these are, are just a manifestation of thanksgiving that come forth from a man or woman who's been touched by the power of the Holy Spirit. He put a new song in my mouth. We'll talk in a couple weeks about how we can't praise him without revelation. We, we can't live a lifestyle of praise unless we cooperate with the Holy Spirit and allow him to put in our mouth, in our heart, that which would magnify Jesus. And we'll talk about how to walk in revelation and to be a people of revelation. I want to focus on the response of a man who was miraculously healed and saved when he encountered Jesus. Why don't you turn with me to Luke chapter 17? In fact, he was one of 10 men who experienced the power of God's healing touch, and yet he was the only one who returned to praise God for what had happened to him. This is a stunning miracle. In Luke chapter 5, Mark chapter 1, there's the story of Jesus ministering to a, to a leper who, who, who was an outcast, of course, and, and he looked at Jesus and said, are you willing to heal me? And Jesus said, I'm willing. He was full of compassion. And he touched him. He was totally transformed. That was one leper. This is 10 lepers, 10 men who were social outcasts, 10 men who were dying a painful, and, and actually it wasn't painful, he was dying, they were dying a slow death, and I'll explain why it wasn't painful. I believe that we need to be reminded not to forget to say thank you for what Jesus has done in our lives. In other words, we would seek to live, we should seek to live a lifestyle of gratitude, a man named Abu Dhabi, I don't know this man, he's a man of God though, he said this, he said, gratitude is like glasses as it helps us see the glory of God's mercy more clearly. May we be empowered from this story to take on a lifestyle of wearing the glasses of gratitude to see God's mercy more clearly in our lives. Okay, Luke chapter 17, if you don't have your Bibles, I have it here for you. Let's read this. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, 10 men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, master, have pity on us. It's interesting that word master in the Greek is, speaks of one who has authority and power. These men understood who Jesus was and, and knew by faith that Jesus could change their lives. It says in verse 14, when he saw them, he said, go show yourself to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He was a Pentecostal. <laughs> he threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Remember, Samaritans were rejected by the Jews. They were half-breeds. They were, they were half Assyrian, and they were half Jewish, and they were seen as unclean. They, they, were, they were rejected by the Jews of the day. Of course, Jesus ministered to a Samaritan woman by the well in John chapter 4, and when the disciples showed up with the food, they were surprised that Jesus was talking to a woman and talking to a Samaritan. You see, our God is... is is a God of the nations. Our God is a God who sees the plight of the nations and he has compassion. Verse 17, Jesus asked, we're not all 10 cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go, your faith has made you well. Of course, that word well there is sozo, it's a word for salvation. You know, nine were healed, but one was healed, but also saved. And we'll talk about that. Let's look at the first point. The first point is this. The leper, leper's condition was hopeless 
and so was ours. Our condition, our spiritual condition was utterly hopeless. Jesus went into that village under the direction of the Holy Spirit to provide an intersection of mercy. Something happens, beloved. Something happens when humanity meets deity. God knew where you were when you met him. We stood at a distance, separated from God. You know, it says in Colossians 1, in verse 21, once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. Jesus went into that village under the direction of the Holy Spirit to provide an intersection of mercy. Do you remember that intersection of mercy where you encountered the power of the Holy Spirit? Do you remember that day when you, you were so ashamed and you carried the guilt of your sin and you were separated from God and maybe you had an addiction to something? Maybe you were an angry man. Maybe you were an abusive man. Maybe you were a rejected man or a woman. But do you remember that day when the Spirit of God got hold of your heart and, and you were never the same after that, never the same again, because you, had, you encountered Jesus in an intersection of mercy. Mercy. I remember that day on April 12th, 1981. I'll never forget it. And I'll never stop praising my King and my God for what he did on that Sunday morning, April 12th, 1981. Heaven came down, touched me, changed me, transformed me. And sometimes we just need to stop and remember what the Lord has done for us and reflect. No leper ever cured himself for it was terminal. There was no remedy. If you contracted leprosy, it was a death sentence which measured out slowly and painfully, for it would deaden the nerves and it would erode the tissues on the hands, arms, and legs. Sin is like spiritual leprosy. It deadens the senses and it takes the Holy Spirit to reveal the true condition of the sinner. I have ministered in India many times, on a, on a number of trips, we, we spent time going to leper colonies. This village right here may, may have been a leper colony. We're not sure. But I met people that look like this. This is a woman here who is suffering the effects of leprosy. It's also known as Hansen's disease. And there's a cure for it today, basic antibiotics, if you catch it early enough, can bring healing to someone who has contracted leprosy. Hansen's disease. Luke 19.10 says the Son of Man came to seek and save that which is lost. That's why he went into that village. That's why he broke into your world. That's why he, he broke into your heart through the conviction of the Holy Spirit because he came to seek and save that which is lost. That's why he's pursuing the the nations and shaking the nations through this pandemic to bring the nations to the end of themselves. They don't know what to do. They don't know where to turn, but the Holy Spirit is working. He's the executive director of the church and he's working. He's bringing conviction to the church of the nations and he's doing a work that we can't see even in this county, even in our midst. He's working. He's always working. These men were outcasts. They were separated from family and friends. There'd be, there would be no Thanksgiving dinner for them. There would be no watching the, the Redskins uh, beat the, the Cowboys on, on Thursday. <laughs> no, they would be totally separated. They, they would be quarantined. Society was afraid of contracting the disease. So the infected were set apart. I remember the movie Ben-Hur, and there's a, there's a part in the movie where Charleston Heston learns of his mother and his sister uh, being in a leper colony because they were put there out of punishment, and they contracted it, and how overwhelmed he was, and he just wept, and he wanted to see his mother, and he wanted to see his sister, and they were lepers. Beloved, this was so serious. This was this, you talk about social distancing. These, these, these men lived a lifestyle of social distancing. Maybe some of them were married. Their wives could never touch them, could never hug them, could never embrace them. 
Their children could, could never get close to them except from a distance. You know, it says in Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2 and, and verse 12, beautiful passage, remember that we were separated from Christ. Paul's writing to a church that he spent three years ministering in, in the city of Ephesus. And this is some years afterwards. He's writing to Christians and he just says, remember, remember that we were separated from Christ. That's, that's what I want today, guys. That's, that's what I sense the Holy Spirit is seeking to do, is to j- jar our memory, to remember when you had spiritual leprosy. Do you remember when you stood at a distance, when you were far, far away from the holiness of God because you were unclean and you were unholy and you were dead in your sins and you were full of guilt and you were sick from head to toe, spiritually speaking? Let us remember that. Remember that we were separated from Christ without hope and without God in the world. These 10 lepers had no hope. They had no destiny. They had no future. Every dream that they had at one time died in their heart. It withered in their heart. There was no dream left. It was just survival, just surviving day by day as their their features became distorted and began to wither just like this woman right here. Leprosy. What a horrible, horrible experience. Paul goes on to say, but now in Christ, Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near through the blood of Jesus. Beautiful. The problem with many who had leprosy or any other disease was that oftentimes they would live without knowing that they had it. Many who have cancer don't realize it until it's too late. Many are lost and they don't know it. And the mercy of God is revealed through the convicting work of the Holy Spirit. You know, I'm an evangelist at heart. And I I have ministered on the streets um, for many, many years. And in conversation with the average person, you know what I discover? The average person on the street believes they are going to heaven. When you ask them the question, when you die, where are you going to go, heaven or hell? And I'm telling you right now, the majority of people that I've talked to, my experience has been, oh, I'm going to go to heaven. Why are you going to go to heaven? Because I'm a good person. Because I was baptized as a baby. Because I go to uh, the church on the corner on Christmas and Easter. And these people are, are in a place, and many of us were in that place, but they don't realize that they have something that's separating them from God. It's called sin. And sin is worse than any disease, beloved. And sin is curable. And I'll talk about that here in a moment. A second point I want us to see is listening and following the direction of the Lord saved us. It saved us. Listen, we always go the wrong way by going our way. Let me say that again. We always go the wrong way by going our way. There's a story in the Old Testament in 2 Kings chapter 5. I would encourage you to read it. It's the story of Naaman, who was a commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given him victory. But one day he woke up, he crawled out of bed, oh, got out of bed, and he discovered something. He discovered he had a spot, a spot, and he knew exactly what it was. This white blemish was on his body, and he knew it was leprosy. Leprosy always started out small. I remember in 1994 ministering in tent meetings uh, in Andhra Pradesh, India. And I remember, I remember the, the couple, the mom and dad that brought their young girl to the healing line. And I was praying for the sick. And uh, we had a wonderful team. And the team was doing the ministry. And this young girl, they said, look at the back of her leg. And and I wasn't very familiar with leprosy at the time. And I, I asked them, I said, what is that? And, and they, with tears in their eyes, they said, it's leprosy. 
her daughter has leprosy. And it was this white, probably about the size of a half dollar. And I prayed for her. And I prayed in Jesus' name that she would be healed. And I completely forgot all about it. We came back the next night, did the tent meeting. There's probably 10,000 people there, 8,000. And lo and behold, the mom and dad brought the daughter to the, to, through the healing line, came up front to testify, and the spot was gone. It was gone. It wasn't Greg Zetz that he ordered. It was Jesus that he ordered, set free by the power of God. And God intervened. And that small little leprosy that was on her leg, that small spot could have grown and could have, could have turned this beautiful young girl into what this woman looks like. It's hideous. It's incessant. It says... When he saw them in verse 14, he said, go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were all healed. The priests of the day were the health inspectors and were the ones to examine the patient, to see the progress of the disease. They were the ones who declared a man healed if a person was miraculously healed. And so there was a a Levitical law said that you had to go to the priest and the priest would examine the body and and see if there was, you know, the removal of the spot or the growth or what have you. And so Jesus is giving directions, giving directions. And guess what they do? They obey. I'm going to go somewhere with this. Now stay with me. They obey. They listen. Leprosy had no cure, no remedy. Sin outside of Jesus has no remedy either. Sin like leprosy often starts small in the heart of a man, which is never something small in the eyes of God. And it escalates and it destroys. But these 10, they knew of the reputation of Jesus. They had heard the stories. They they read it in in Luke's gospel (laughs) In chapter 4, that Jesus healed all lepers. They had faith. There was something within them that expected a breakthrough in their bodies. And so they turn around and they start walking to the temple. And God heals them. Listen, beloved. These men cried out in a loud voice. And hopefully you have cried out for divine intervention. You see, there's a shout that stops God. There's a shout that stops God. He inclined his ear and he heard my cry. I guarantee you David's cry was a shout of desperation, a shout of of calling out for divine intervention in his life there in Psalm 40. These men cried out. Do you have a cry in your heart today? Let me tell you something. Delay does not mean denial. Delay does not mean denial. The breakthrough that you're praying for that hasn't come yet, it does not mean denial. It does not mean God hasn't heard you and God, I'm telling you, God is working in your situation. Don't lose your shout. Don't lose your cry. Don't become discouraged. Don't don't allow the, the, the narrative that you see with your natural eyes and hear with your natural ears to govern how you're going to respond to God and his his magnificent, amazing grace. God is working on your behalf. We see in Mark chapter 10, speaking of Bartimaeus, when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus was passing by, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he he shouted all the more. There's another Pentecostal here. Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called to the blind man. Cheer up. See how the crowd is so fickle, how people change. Cheer up. On your feet. He's calling you. And of course, Jesus gave him sight. He gave him sight. The the cry of a man or a woman to Jesus will always stop Jesus. There's not a single person in the Gospels that Jesus did not heal that came to him. And these men are no different. Again, this is a stunning, stunning miracle. But you know what? It's very important. We need to listen and follow the direction of the Lord. 
you know, getting back to Naaman, Naaman had so much pride and Elijah sent a messenger and said, listen, Naaman, this is what you need to do. You need to go to the Jordan and you need to dip in the Jordan seven times. Well, Naaman was very, very angry and he thought he would lead him to some of the finer rivers that were present there in that geographic location of Israel and the cleaner rivers of the day. And Naaman got all upset. And it says there in, in uh, 5 and verse 13 of 2 Kings, it says, Naaman's servant went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you to wash and be cleansed that you obey? Beloved, this is a very, very important point because listening and following the direction of the Lord saved us and will continue to work in our lives. It's called obedience. Let me give you a couple examples here. Acts chapter 2, verse 37 to 39. When the people heard this, Peter's preaching on the day of Pentecost. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? And Peter replied, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. My late father-in-law um, went to be with Jesus way back in 2008. 2008. This is Margie's father. And he and I were talking, probably it was in the 90s, and, and he had, I brought up Billy Graham, and he said something. He said, you know, in the 1950s, a bunch of us went to hear Billy Graham preach down in Washington, D.C. I said, no way. He goes, yeah, we went, we heard him preach. And I said, well, what, what happened? What was your experience? And he said, well, he gave a, a, a call, and he called the crowd, if anybody wanted to surrender their life to Christ, to come forward and receive Christ. And I said, you know, I said, did you? And he said, no. He goes, there's, there's just no way I believe that I could go forward and pray a prayer and go to heaven. And of course, he didn't understand the big picture of the gospel, as it says in Romans chapter 10. Look at this. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord Anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. And guess what? And it was, it was sad. I walked away sad because we always go the wrong way by, by going our way. And my father-in-law lived the majority of his life separated from Christ, living for self. And we, we had the joy of leading him to Jesus before he died on his deathbed in 2008. And I preached at his funeral. But a whole life was wasted. Years and years went by. Why? Because there was a stronghold in his mind. And that stronghold was against God and his ways. And that was a stronghold that kept him from coming into a place of recognizing he had spiritual leprosy. And it was only the mercy of God that could come and be released in his life that would bring him into a place of right order with the living God through the new birth. Beloved, I'm telling you, there's a lot, there's a lot of people like that who are going the wrong way because of their way. And these men, these 10 men were healed because they went in the right direction, because they obeyed what Jesus told them to do. And it's no different for us, not only involving our salvation and coming to Christ, but our day-to-day -day living, obeying his voice, following him, doing what he tells us to do. That's the supernatural life. That's the way of the believer. That's the way of the disciple. John chapter 2 and verse 5, his mother said to the servants, 
Do whatever he tells you. Do whatever he tells you. And that's the wedding of Cana. And Jesus said, take six pots, large uh, pots, and fill them with water. And he turned the water into wine. What if they said, I, I don't, I don't, I, I know more about wine than this carpenter does. And I'm not going to do what he tells me. There would be no miracle. There would be no breakthrough. There would have been no uh, miracle, his first miracle written in the gospel of John in John chapter two. Do you see what I'm getting at? When we obey his word, when we obey his voice, things happen. I could tell you story after story after story of this dynamic happening in my own life and seeing it happen here at King of the Nations among the brothers and sisters in Christ here. But we can't live in the obedience of the past. We have to obey his voice now, today, hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to us today. Let's get to the last point. Praise him to thank him. Praise him to thank him. Let me give you the first two points again so you can stay with me. Praise him to thank him. Number one, the leper's condition was hopeless, and so was ours, and so was ours. You might be listening today, and you've never, ever come to a point of surrendering to the cross and the finished work, because in your mind, you think you're good enough to go to heaven. I'm going to tell you something. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. So the deception that you're in is dangerous. It, it would be like a, a man who's been diagnosed with leprosy, but has no signs of it yet. And ignoring, ignoring the trajectory of the disease, ignoring where the man's going to be in a year or two years and what he could end up looking like. There's a place of denial. And you might be listening to me and you're in that denial, but I'm going to tell you something. The Holy Spirit's speaking to you and revealing your true condition because you may be nice and you may be good and you may be a friend to someone and you may love your children or love your spouse, but I'm telling you right now, if the Holy Spirit hasn't brought transformation in your heart through the finished work of the cross, Jesus died on the cross in your place. You are a breath away from eternal damnation. And that's what grips my heart today is recognizing all of us were, were a breath away from hell. And God intervened and God set us free. Secondly, listening and following the direction of the Lord. It saved us. It saved us. And thirdly, praise him to thank him. Praise him to thank him. Let's finish up here. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. It's an interesting word, um, loud voice. It's also used when Jesus exercised a demon and the demon shouted. It's the same Greek word there. You know, in my research, I discovered that uh, leprosy will attack the, the, the larynx. It will attack the vocal cords. It, will, it, it could literally take the voice away from the leper. And, you know, this guy is so full of emotion. I mean, there's something, something alive in his heart, in his life, and he's just shouting. Look at it. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet, and he thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. And Jesus asked, we're not all ten cleansed. Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? That's an interesting word there too, foreigner. Uh, this was on the wall. The, the, the word here, al allogen, is equals foreigner. And that was on the wall in the temple. See, the Gentiles could not go into the temple. There was a Gentile court, but they could not go in. And here is this Samaritan, totally transformed and cleansed. Now he has a hope. Now he has a future. Now the dream in his heart can be resurrected under the lordship of Jesus Christ. And look where we find him. We find him at the feet of Jesus. Do a study at all the people in the Gospels, all the people, I'm thinking of Mary Magdalene, all the people who are found at the feet of Jesus. That's where we should live, beloved. 
That's where, where we should encounter him at his feet. He is Lord. He is our king. He is our God. Then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. Who are you like? Then this, this is be honest here. Who are you like? Are you like the, the nine who didn't return to praise Jesus? Or are you like the Samaritan who returned and surrendered his life to Christ? What lifestyle depicts you? The, the nine who got healed and felt feel better and are, are totally now in a new place to live life, but they walk away from the one that healed them and now they just want to they just want to have a little bit of God. They got a little bit of God. Now they just want to have a lot of themselves and they want to do what they want to do. Are you like that? Stop today and look and see what the Lord has done in your life. You were a breath away from being lost for eternity. He saved you and he transformed you in your spiritually leprous condition into a new creation. Wow. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 15 one of my favorite passages, and it's really a life verse for me. He died for all. He died for all the spiritual lepers, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and was raised again. Is that your call? Is that your theme? Is that your life verse? Is that the principle that guides you and governs you? Is that, is that the way of the kingdom of God in your life? Or are you like the 10? I never, ever, ever want to forget where I came from. I never want to forget how far, far down I was when Jesus took, took me out of that pit, out of that miry clay. I never want to forget. And I want to keep that alive in my heart every day. I remember in 1981, I was alive. I was so alive. And I went to Mexico and I'm, I'm playing ball on the, the church softball team. And my talent and, and, and just the joy that I experienced in playing uh, was igniting and making something come alive, igniting my heart and making something come alive in me. And I, I remember hearing a voice in my head, and I was talking also to some friends, and and you know there were minor league tryouts that were taking place that summer, and 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 not to boast, but I but I had you know a very very fast fastball, and I could hit a baseball a country mile as my father used to say, and there was something I was thinking, you know, here I am, I'm 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 in the prime of my life, I'm not, I'm not even 20 years old, I've been rescued from an addiction to alcohol, I've been totally set free, I'm a child of God, but I'm hearing this this idea in my head, which isn't sin, but it was like the Holy Spirit spoke to me very quickly and said, I spoke to you in Mexico, you're called, you're a called man. I've called you to preach. I've called you into the ministry. And right there, when I heard that, I was cut in my heart. And I felt, I felt this, this, this conviction. No, no, no. That option to do what I want to do is no longer an option. An option to pursue what I want to pursue, pursue the career I want to uh, pursue. That's no longer an option. I need to come to the feet of Jesus. I need to come into a place of surrender. I need to recognize there's a, there's a mandate on my life. It's called the call of God. And that's way back in 1981. And I said, Lord, I never want to go there again. I never want to entertain that again. I, I never want to be double-minded in my purpose again because you called me. And I'm telling you today, guys, I, I just feel the fire of God in my heart. In this season of thanksgiving, God is calling King of the Nations and all here hear my voice into a place, a new dimension of, of expressing gratitude in our heart for who he is and what he's done in our lives, not just for saving us, but every single day of our lives is the mercy of God. I'm walking around with no pain in my knee and I'm going, oh, Jesus. I was at, at Whole Foods for the first time in two months, and I'm walking around that store, and I, I was thinking how just two months earlier I walked with such pain, and I limped, and, and people looked at me and said, what's wrong, and what's going on, and, and I walked all over that store with absolutely no pain. I thank God for doctors. I thank God for the grace of God through doctors that healed me and touched me. 
Oh, beloved, we have so much to be thankful for. Some of us are just, are just so focused on ourselves and we're miserable and there's self-pity and we feel sorry and for ourselves and, and we're like, oh, I'm not going to get my way for Thanksgiving. Who cares? Who cares? We have so much to be thankful for and so much to bless the Lord for. I feel, I feel the grace of God and I feel the mercy of God today that he's a good, good father. There was a song that was brought forth way back when during the Pensacola revival and Lyndall Cooley used to sing it. Look what the Lord has done. Just look what the Lord has done. He healed my body. He touched my mind. He saved me. It was just in time. I'm going to praise his name. I could sing this, but I'm not going to. I'll start crying. For each day, he's just the same. He never changes. So come on and praise him. Look what the Lord has done. Look at the last verse. I was bound by the chains of darkness and sin. I had no hope. No peace of mind. My sins were as scarlet. He washed them white as snow. He opened up my blinded eyes. Look what the Lord has done. Spiritually, you might look like this. On the inside, you're withering, you're dying. You're totally falling apart. The wages of sin is death. You're dead spiritually. I got good news for you today. Today is a day, the Bible calls today the day of salvation. It's the acceptable time to do what? To surrender, to fall at the feet of Jesus to recognize your true spiritual condition, that you're a spiritual leper. And today, God wants to extend his hand of grace and save you right where you are. This is the message. This is the good news of the gospel, the death, the burial, and resurrection. And he died for you. And I tell you, I've been all over the world and I've seen a lot of miracles, but the greatest miracle I've ever seen is the new birth, where God can turn a spiritual leper into a beautiful new creation in Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. And you're like, I'm ready. Pastor, I'm ready. I'm glad you're ready because God has made you ready and he has shown you the diagnosis, the spiritual priest, in a sense, the Holy Spirit, the spiritual priest, he's come and he's diagnosed you and said, no, 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 you have leprosy and you're going to die a spiritual leper. And he has shown you, the Bible says he convicts men of unrighteousness and he proves them guilty. He's the prosecuting attorney. He never loses a case. And so right where you are right now, I want you to pray with me. I just want you to surrender. Just pray with me. Just say, Father, go ahead, say it. Just say, Father, if you were right here, I would just hold your hands and I would say, just say, Father, what a beautiful name. You've prayed the Lord's Prayer, our Father in heart and to heaven, hallowed be thy name. But no, no, not out of rote, not out of a religious mindset. This is personal. You just say, Father. Father, here I am today. I'm a spiritual leper and I need a savior. Today, I ask that you'd save me through your son, Jesus. Just say that. Save me through your son, Jesus. You're following the directions right now, what the word says. Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, say this. Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, come into my heart and cleanse me. I repent or I turn from the direction that I've been going with my life. My selfishness, my sinful ways, I turn from that and I turn to you. I turn towards you. Set me free from my sin and my guilt through the blood that you shed for me. You see, you were so valuable, Jesus shed his blood for you. The blood of Jesus never loses its power. The blood of Jesus is the most precious, precious commodity in the universe. And he shed his blood so that you would no longer live in your sin. For it says in Revelation 1 and verse 5, he has released us from our sins 
through his blood. Praise God. If you prayed that prayer, if you, you, you know, the spirit of God is here and he's, he's on you. And if you, you need help, please reach out to us. There's people right now online that you can connect with and they'll reach out to you. We're here for you. You know, it, it, the, the word there with the lepers it says they were cleansed. Um, it's, a, it's a word that speaks of a total removal, a total cleansing. There was just, there was a, wasn't a hint of any leprosy in their body. They were totally cleansed. And you know what? That's what happens to us. The blood of Jesus cleanses us. And the guilt, the shame, the condemnations, the, the memory of sin, the things we think about that accuse us to ourselves, the blood of Jesus removes all of that. So there's not a trace of our past that controls how God sees us. Because the Bible says he chooses to remember our sins no more. Wow. Wow. This is a good day. And this is going to be a good week. And I just want to encourage you, church, king of the nations, rey de las naciones, I just want to encourage you to start fresh today. Just lift up your voice and just praise him. Just do that right now. Just praise the Lord for his goodness. Praise him in the morning. Praise him in the noontime. Praise him in the evening. Make a joyful sound unto the Lord right now. Well, I've got to go. My time is up. I could preach all day, I think, today. Maybe I'll go out on the streets and have some communique with someone who's a spiritual leper and tell them about Jesus. Church, I just want to encourage you uh, to be faithful in your giving. It's right there. You know what to do. Thank you so much for honoring uh, this house with your, your giving and being faithful to the Lord. And, and uh, we, just, we just bless the name of the Lord. We're going to get through this. God's got a plan. Let's make the most of this opportunity. Let's let our roots go down deep. Let's not give up. Let's not quit. Let's not faint. For in due season, we'll reap a harvest. We have some good things coming up in December. We're just going to persevere. Amen? We're going to persevere. I'm going to keep preaching to an empty room. <laughs> and I know God is using it. God is speaking. But I so, so look forward to seeing you guys and, and preaching and preaching face to face. We're going to do that. It's coming. May the Lord richly bless you. I love you in Jesus. Amen.